the moon! Chapter 3, Laika and Sputnik 2. October the 4th, 1957. Sergei Korolev launches the first satellite, his satellite, into orbit. Sputnik was a triumph, one that achieved all of the USSR's scientific and political goals. There simply had to be a follow-up to Sputnik, and in just over a month, on the 7th of November, was the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. What better way to celebrate the dismantling of the Tsarist autocracy than by launching a second satellite? Now, there are some conflicting sources on how Korolev was approached about this endeavour. Some say he was invited to a big thank you for making Sputnik reception hosted by the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, during which Khrushchev made the suggestion that it would be real nice if another Sputnik was launched to celebrate the upcoming anniversary. Hint, hint. Others say Khrushchev simply phoned the various rocket officials to make these strong hints, of which there are further conflicting stories. Some say Korolev initially protested about the short time frame before reluctantly accepting the project, and others say he leapt on the opportunity without hesitation. All we know is, he's the Stig. Sorry, couldn't help myself. With the launch date decided, and Sputnik 2 given the go-ahead, Korolev scrambled his team to figure out just what they were going to do. This satellite obviously had to be bigger and better than the first one, and Korolev had the perfect suggestion. Sputnik 2 would measure the radiation output of the Sun, the data would be transmitted only when the satellite was above Soviet ground control stations, oh, and it would also carry a dog into space. Yes, Sputnik 2 would carry on board the first living organism, along with a buttload of monitoring equipment to investigate the effects of spaceflight on a living being, paving the way for a manned mission into space. With less than four weeks until the launch date, the team decided to repurpose some of the bits from their old research rockets. You see, since the 1940s, the USSR had been putting animals on board ballistic missiles. This was to test what happens to living things when they fly at high altitudes. Tapping into this wealth of knowledge, and more importantly, equipment, meant that Sputnik 2's dog cabin was practically ready to go. This spacious 80 by 64 centimeter tube has everything a dog could want. Equipped with top-of-the-range sensors to measure the cabin's pressure and temperature, these devices will also monitor the lucky occupant's blood pressure, heartbeat, and breathing rate. Speaking of breathing, I thought there was no air in space. Fear not, as the onboard alkaline compounds will generate oxygen and consume any carbon dioxide produced by the Cosmo Dog. Talk about a place with a good atmosphere. And of course, no cabin is complete without a kitchen. That's why this state-of-the-art feeding system will provide a daily dollop of highly calorific jelly for up to 20 days. Whoever ends up living in this cabin will be floating both from happiness and lack of gravity. That's why it comes with a special corset that will allow the space canine to stand up, sit down, lay down, and pace back and forth while they admire the heavens out of this cute port-facing window. So with the dog cabin sorted, they needed to find a dog to actually put in it. But this couldn't just be any dog. They needed one they knew could endure the hardships of space travel. Enter Oleg Kazenko, a Soviet scientist who specialized in space biology so he could develop medicines relevant to weightlessness and flying at high orbits. Kazenko went out and collected 10 stray dogs from the streets of Moscow. Scientists often chose strays because they knew they were tough little dogs, having already survived the harsh Russian winters and potentially extreme hunger. They trained the dogs by placing them in centrifuges and various other situations with intense loud noise. This was to simulate the highly stressful environment of a rocket launch and to see which of the dogs coped the best. After a few sessions, there was a clear leader of the pack, and the personnel at the labs had various nicknames for her. Some called her Kudryavka, which roughly translates to Little Curly. Some called her Zhushka, meaning Little Bug. And, my personal favourite, Limunchik, which kind of means Little Lemon. But to you and I, she will always be known as Laika, which is the name for a Russian breed of dog, and also means Barker. Just in case something went wrong during the final days of training, they had a backup dog called Albina, who was a veteran of flight at this point, as she'd already flown twice during the high-altitude ballistic tests. For scientific measure, there was a control dog called Mushka. Now, she was kept on the ground and hooked up to monitoring machines for calibration purposes. Initially, Mushka had been a solid candidate to go into space, but because she was a fushy little eater, they decided to keep her on Earth instead. Early November, and the newly renovated R-7 rocket sat poised on a frost-covered launch pad at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Chiratam. Korolev and his team were working on the final preparations for the launch, one of which was ensuring that the satellite remained attached to the rocket when it reached orbit. 
This was partly due to the precious cargo on board that could be damaged during a separation, but also because the rocket could house the lofty transmission equipment that would relay the valuable data back down to Soviet soil. With Laika on board, Sputnik 2 was launched on the 3rd of November 1957, just 30 days after Korolev had successfully launched Sputnik 1. Had he achieved the near impossible and put the first two satellites into space in just under a month? After a successful takeoff and a tense 300 seconds later, the core stage of the rocket shut down as planned. Sputnik 2 had made it to orbit. Almost immediately, many Soviet ground sites started receiving and processing the data from the spacecraft, with amateur radio enthusiasts also listening in. The question on everyone's mind, had Laika survived the launch? Initial data showed that during takeoff her heartbeat was at 260 cycles per minute, three times higher than normal, and her breathing had increased fivefold. Thankfully, once in orbit and the roar of the engines below her fell silent, Laika returned to her normal self, alive, and something that's probably worth pointing out, the first living creature in space. Sputnik 2 continued to orbit and, right, I'm going to stop things for a second. While researching this video, I realise there are some things you just cannot unlearn. That's why I'm giving you the opportunity to choose how much you want to know about the fate of Sputnik 2, and more importantly, Laika. Consider this part 1 of 2, where we will follow up with what happened to both the satellite and its passenger, with clear skip points so you can choose to omit anything you don't want to hear. Okay? All good? Awesome. Click here for part 2, but first let's find out how Sputnik 2 was received around the world. A biography of Sergei Korolev says that the autumn of 1957 was the happiest time of his life. His work had changed the course of history and massively advanced mankind's endeavour into space. Of course, he wasn't the only one that was happy with the launch, as Nikita Khrushchev boasted in various speeches, now our first Sputnik is not lonely in its space travels, though most of his happiness stemmed from the fear the USSR was instilling in the Americans. On the other side of the Atlantic, the Sputnik crisis was in full effect, with various committees meeting with President Eisenhower, panicking of the technological gap between the US and the Soviets. Eisenhower played it cool, and would not be pressured into backing costly, hot-headed schemes <coughs> nuclear weapons. <coughs> Still, he knew he had to do something. On the next, to the moon. Russia has some big ideas, and the USA launches its first satellite. Sort of. 